Micah, the prophet. When we get to heaven, it may well be that we will meet with Micah, and he may say to you, did you read my book? And some of you may say, I would have done, but I couldn't find it. <laughs> will say, well, it is in the index. <laughs> Micah, the prophet Micah at chapter 4. I'm reading just seven verses. But in the last days, it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow into it and many nations shall come and say come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths for the Lord shall go forth out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem and he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hoops. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. For all people will walk, every one in the name of his God. Or as other translations put it, for people who walk in the names of their God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Amen. In that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that halter, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted. And I will make her that halt of a remnant, and her that was cast far off a strong nation, and the Lord shall reign over them in the Mount Zion from henceforth, even forever. May the Lord bless that portion of his word to his your hearts. We're working our way through the Minor Prophets. We're halfway there. I don't know whether that's encouraging to you or not. But we're halfway there and we're here with Micah. What I would normally do is, is, is ask generally some of the encouragement. When we get to the book, we ask, what's his name? What's his address? And what's his occupation? Well, Micah means, uh, I believe, that God is, God is, I should have written it down, but I've got to write it down. That God is the Lord, or something like that. My colours, he was like God. He was so like God. Who is like Who is like who is like unto who God? Like unto God. Right. And his address is Southern Israel. And his occupation is that of a prophet. He was given a job by the Lord and it was his ministry to go out and to prophesy, to speak of what the Lord had said. Going back, uh, my mind is going blank here so you have to bear with me. <laughs> Cheer me on as I'm going along. <laughs> you remember that Solomon, when Solomon died, 
Solomon had left because of his lifestyle. He moved away from the Lord and he had many wives and it was a very costly affair. And he taxed the nation up to the hills. So that when he died and his son took over, the 12 tribes sent representatives to his son Rehoboam to ask, was he going to ease the taxes? Was he going to make this living in Israel a lot easier? And instead of saying yes, he foolishly said no, he would tax them even more. So 10 of the tribes rebelled and they moved north. And two of the tribes stayed south with him, Jerusalem, Judah, and Benjamin. And the 10 tribes that moved north on the man called Jeroboam, they set up their own idolatrous city, Samaria. And in there they worshipped idols. They turned their backs upon God. And for 200 years the Lord allowed this, but constantly warned them, if they continued in this, they would be carried away. And the minor prophets, or at least nine of the minor prophets, so-called, nine of the minor prophets were the ones who went out during that 200 year period to appeal and to seek to bring them back to the Lord. The Lord, during that 200 year period, after the first quarter of the century, or after the first half century, the first of the year, the Lord sent Elijah. Elijah wasn't a writing prophet. He sent Elijah, then he sent Elisha. Jonah went out there, and Jonah, he, the, the, the nation, the prevalent nation, the big nation, the world nation, the world power of that day was Assyria. Not Syria, but Assyria. And they were very cruel, the cruelest of all the nations that ruled the world. And they reigned for almost 400 years. But they were big during these days. And Jonah went out and he subdued them for a short while. There was revival there, but it didn't last. And so the Lord sent along to the ten tribes as they became more and more idolatrous. The Lord sent along Hosea and Amos. And Amos pleaded with them shouted at them almost, they preached the law to them, but they took no notice. And then Hosea went, and Hosea was more, dare I say, soft-hearted. He was more gentle. Hosea is that one who the Lord said, go marry the woman who became a, a prostitute. And he didn't do anything with them. And then after they had gone, the Lord raised up Micah. Now, Michael was a contemporary with Isaiah, and he prophesied during the same time that Isaiah prophesied. They were friends, as far as I could see, they seemed to quote each other in their book. But Micah, he was told to preach, and he was told to go and preach to the ten tribes in the north, and to warn them the capital of Samaria, we get this in the first verses. But he was also told to preach to the south, to the two tribes that were in the south. Because although the ten tribes had become idolatrous, and the Lord warned them, Ephraim is turned to idols, lesser the Lord says Hosea. The two tribes were slowly and surely becoming idolatrous as well. And Micah was told to prophesy not only to the north, but to the south. Now when the north were eventually taken away, they took no notice of the prophets. When the north were eventually 722, the, the year 722 BC, when they were eventually carried off, the southern tribes, they remained for another 100 to 150 years before eventually they turned holy to idols and the Lord then sent down Nebuchadnezzar who by this time had conquered the Assyrians and the Babylonians were now ruling and reigning. That's not too confusing. No. You're okay with me, so some of you are still going to put a look on your face. But that's where they fit, that's where at least six to nine of the minor prophets fit in to round about that particular area. Now one of the jobs I'm going to try and do here this morning, this impossible task, 
is when we're in chapter 1 and verse 1, when we have Micah, who is writing the prophecy out, he writes it out in his day. But when we get to the chapter I read out, chapter 4, but in the last days, and the very last days of the latter times, it will come to pass that the mountain will have the, that he's speaking now about the temple that will be built on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And so the timeline from chapter 1 and verse 1 to chapter 4 and verse 1 is something like two and a half thousand years. So I'm going to take you on this trip this morning to try and cover, <laughs> to try and fill in, or to try and fit in where it goes. I think, could be wholly wrong in this, but from my studies over the years, that when the Lord spoke to the prophets and through the prophets, as they went out and they did what they did, toward the end of their lives, they wrote down what the Lord had told them to do. And in some cases, Isaiah, as far as I can see, Isaiah wrote down what the Lord was going to do to the next, there were 66 chapters in Isaiah. Isaiah wrote down what the Lord was doing with the nation and for the nation. And then he concentrated on the Gentiles and he wrote down what the Lord had told them to write about the Gentiles. Now, they were not necessarily in chronological order. In subject, they may well have been chronological. You get the same with Jeremiah. To try and follow Jeremiah chronologically is difficult. You get the same in the Gospels. Sometimes when the Lord has been speaking about Matthew, Mark and Luke, when they write it down, you're not sure what comes after one thing in Matthew's Gospel. It doesn't come after, it doesn't go the same way in Luke's Gospel. A few chapters go between. Now I believe that when Micah was given these various prophecies. And when he wrote at the end, he wrote down the prophecies as the Lord spoke with him, but he never wrote them down in the order that they will actually happen. You understand what I'm talking about? So that in chapters four and chapter five, in the first three chapters, easy enough, Micah is preaching to the ten tribes and to the two tribes and he's warning them and he's pleading with them and he's telling them to turn their backs upon their sin and to get right with God and they take no notice. And then he fits in two chapters which are out of sync and then when we get to the last two chapters, six and seven, then he goes back to what he was saying in chapters 1, 2 and 3 and he pleads with them. You see, I believe he was around in 722 when the Assyrians came and dealt with the ten tribes, carried them all away and scattered them among the nations. I believe he was around then. And he turned to the two tribes to warn them. You probably won't remember, but when we were in Hosea, when Hosea is pleading and he spoke to the ten tribes, when he's speaking to them and when he's pleading with them, when we get to chapter 11 and we see the house of God in that book of Hosea. We have the Lord saying at one point, Oh, Israel, what shall I do with you? Here's the one who loved them so much. But when we get to chapter 11, the Lord realizes he's not going to repent. The same with the two chapters, he's not going to repent. And the Lord realizes that he's got to stand back 
and let them do what they're doing. But in doing so, he said they would be punished. He's going to say through Ezekiel, you, you remember, he told Ezekiel, so, I think chapter 4, lie on your side, lie on your right side for so many days, and then on your left side. And then the Lord said, all the days that you lie on your right side, each day would be counted as a year. And when that added up, the Lord then said, or points him to Leviticus, where the Lord said, that's now going to be multiplied by seven. And he said, you will go into captivity, and for seven times, that whatever it was, in years, you will be away from the Lord. And he says in chapter 11, Israel, how can I let you go? Such a love for them. It's breaking his heart. Oh, how can I let you go? But he lets them go. And when they went into captivity there, through the Assyrians, the captivity lasted all through the rest of the Old Testament, right through the 400 years between the Testaments, and for almost 2,000 years, right the way up to 1948. So for almost two, two and a half thousand years, the Israelis were there. But now we have Micah. And Micah is speaking with them. And he says to them in verse, I'm just picking verses out here, if I can remember where the verses are. In chapter 5 and verse 2, he says, But thou, you know this verse. Now Micah is speaking to the nation. He says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though thou be, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be a ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. Now you know that verse, where do you know that verse from? You know that verse from Christmas. That when the wise men came to Herod and asked, where is he who was born king of the Jews? Herod had to go to the high priest or the leaders in Israel and asked where would he be born. And they quoted that particular verse, but thou, Bethlehem, not small. Michael was a contemporary with Isaiah. Let me try to fit him in a little bit here. Isaiah was prophesying under the king called Ahaz. After Ahaz came Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a brilliant king, but Ahaz was a wicked king. Hezekiah's son, grandson, was a dreadful king, the worst king they ever had. But Ahaz, the ten tribes got together, they were being persecuted by Assyria. They were paying taxes they didn't want to pay. And so they approached this smaller country called Syria, not a city, but Syria, and Egypt. And they said, if we get together, we can attack Assyria, and we can conquer them and get them off our backs. And they come along to the two tribes, and they ask the two tribes, Judah, if they will help. And King Ahaz says, no. And they say, well, we will attack you, and we will deal with you. And so King Ahaz decides that the way out is to go to the king of Assyria and ask him for help. And in chapter 7, Isaiah meets with Ahaz, the king, and says, whatever you do, make that the very last thing. He says to him, in fact, he says, pray and ask the Lord to give you a sign. Any sign in heaven or upon the earth. And Ahaz says, I wouldn't presume upon the Lord. He's a hypocrite. I wouldn't presume upon the Lord. And Isaiah says, you won't ask the Lord for a sign. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. 
Behold, a virgin shall conceive and be with child. You know the prophecy. And then Isaiah turns to the nation and he says that there's coming a time when there will be war, when there will be bloodshed. But in order to encourage them, he points them to the Lord and he says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and of his kingdom there shall be no end, and peace there shall be no end, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Master and Father. <coughs> The Prince of Peace. And I think Micah jumps in at this. After Isaiah has spoken about his kingdom and peace, there shall be no end. Isaiah is looking forward and he's looking to eternity future when his kingdom will never end. It will go on and on and on. We very much about that. And I think Micah jumps in and he says uh, to, the, uh, to the Jews and to, to, to the two tribes, but thou Bethlehem, Though you are little among the thousands of Jews, the young shall come forth unto me, a ruler, that's an Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Whereas Isaiah says his kingdom will go on forever, Michael is saying his kingdom, this person, has gone on forever in eternity past. So the Lord Jesus Christ is seen as the eternal one in a past eternity and in a future eternity. But then, in verse 3, sorry, verse 5, up there. We, 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 we find Micah, after doing this, he mentions Babylon, just trying to find where we have Babylon. In verse 10 of chapter 4. Toward the, end of the, toward the end of the verse, thou shalt go even to Babylon. He said, there shalt thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. Now he's moving away and he's moving 150 years to the time when Nebuchadnezzar came down and carried the two. The ten tribes have gone into captivity, scattered. The two tribes are going into captivity. And they are going because they did exactly the same as the ten tribes did. They turned from God to idols. They became so idolatrous that the Lord allowed them to be carried away. But he said, when you are in Babylon, Babylon will teach you what nobody else can teach you. What happened to the nation in Babylon? What was the difference in Babylon? When they came out of Babylon, the nation of Israel were no longer idolatrous. They'd gone there because they turned idolatrous. But when they came from Babylon, the nation was no longer idolatrous. Under Daniel, they were no longer idolatrous. The nation of Israel today are, I think it's the right word, monogamous. They are not idolatrous. Keep that in mind because we'll see that in a few minutes. They no longer worship idols. They worship the Lord or they worship Jehovah as such. Then he goes on and he speaks about, you know, what, what happened in verse 5 and verse 3. Therefore, he will give them up. When they were carried away, we have the rest of the Old Testament. We have the time when the Lord Jesus Christ came. But it's a time when the Lord has given up on the nation as such. And we have this 2,000 year period. He shall give them up. Just trying to look at the verse Isaiah. Anyway, he gave them up. The Lord stood back. And the nation of Israel in 70 AD went into captivity. Sorry, in 70 AD the Romans came and they 
pulled out of the temple and the nation of Israel was scattered so that the whole 12 tribes now were scattered throughout the world. And here in their scattering throughout the world, the Lord speaks to them. I'm just trying to think of the verse, see if I can find it. It's an unusual verse. Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 7. They went back into the land in 1948. They sought to settle in the land, but they are in the land without Christ. And they will be there until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back again. But Isaiah says some strange things. Isaiah says in verse 7, Before she travailed, speaking about the nation of Israel, before she travailed birth pain, before she travailed she brought forth, before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who has heard of such a thing? Or who's seen such things? As I was saying to the nation, before there's going to become a period when the nation of Israel, you can understand us better than always, when the nation of Israel, waiting for their Messiah, they will go through birth pangs. But Isaiah says that the child shall be born before the birth pangs come. Unusual. Matthew 24, when the disciples came to the Lord Jesus, they said to the Lord, what should be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And you remember the Lord gave them a number of signs. And he said, verse 8, these are the beginning of sorrows. And a lot of translations translate that word sorrows. These are the beginning of the birth pain. There was a build-up. There will be a build-up. When there are birth pangs, they start slow. I must speak from experience, by the way. They start slowly and they build up. And in Matthew 24, we have this slow build-up. There shall be false messiahs, false prophets. There shall be wars and rumours of wars. There should be pestilences. There should be earthquakes. There should be famines. And then as it gets stronger, the Lord said, ye shall be persecuted of all nations for my name's sake. And so in Matthew 24, he's showing them how the birth pangs will build up. He speaks a lot, going back to, to Micah, we'll come back to this tomorrow. He speaks in Micah of one who he calls the Assyrian. Verse 5 of chapter 5. And this man shall be the peace when the Assyrian shall come into our land. The story is they've been 2,000 years scattered. They're now back in the land. When they are in the land, this man called here the Assyrian, this, this name Assyrian, it's one of the names of the man of sin, the beast. There are over, I was listening to the week, a man say, there are over 30 different names given to the man of sin, the beast, the antichrist, the false prophet. They're all mentioned over 30 names. And one of the names is this, the Assyrian. He will be desperately cruel. The book of Revelation, from chapter 6, we have a period, from chapter 6 to chapter 19, we have a period of seven years. This seven years spoken of by Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 is a period that the Bible calls the tribulation. The Lord Jesus called it the tribulation in Matthew chapter 24. It begins in chapter 6 of the Revelation, when 
The man on the white horse is identified as the man of sin. He will come and he will conquer with peace. And for three and a half years, the world will know a measure of peace it hasn't known for a long, long time. He will win the nations over. And then in the middle of this three and a half years, for his own reasons, he will decide that he's not just a politician and a king, but rather he's a god. Now, at the beginning of the seven years, the nation of Israel, thinking possibly that he is the Messiah, will sign a seven-year contract with him, wherein he promises them peace. Look at them now. Once this war is finished, and it was pointed out to me during the week that Israel in the latter days have had a number of wars but they have never won a war come on now. no he said they've always been victorious but they've always had to stop before they've completed the job they set out to do because the nations of the world demanded and that's what they're doing now demanded a ceasefire and they will sign this seven year contract with this man of sin, this man on the white horse. It will be a covenant with death, says Isaiah in Isaiah 28. And when they sign their covenant with death, during that three and a half year period of peace, 144,000 Jewish evangelists will evangelize the world. They will preach the gospel of the kingdom. Glorious gospel. A little bit different than ours. Oh, it's the gospel of grace. John the Baptist, he preached the gospel of the kingdom. The Lord Jesus preached after John had died the gospel of the kingdom. But the kingdom was put on the back burner. But now they will preach the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of grace. You still need that. They will still need the Lord Jesus Christ as saviour. To trust them as saying before. But you see, once this man of sin, and once the Israeli side disagree, once he signs this seven year contract, seven years from that day, the Lord Jesus Christ will come back again to the earth. The man of sin will know this. The Lord Jesus Christ will come back so that the 144,000 Jews can preach. The gospel of the kingdom, because the kingdom is going to be set up, and they can give a date. You ask me, is Jesus coming back for us? And I'll say, yes. And if you say to me, when? I'll say, soon. Give us a date, Peter. I can't give you a date. But in that coming day, they will be able to give you a date from the time this man of sin signed. And so, for the three and a half years of peace, hundreds, thousands will be saved. There'll be no persecution as such, but once this man sets himself up as, as a god, then Israel, who are monogamous, will recognise he is now the abomination of desolation. He's put an idol in the temple, and he wants them to worship the idol, and then they rebel. And that heralds in what the Bible calls the Great Tribulation. And for three and a half years, the last half of the seven years, the world will pass through a stage that Jesus said they've never passed through before. It will be a time of trouble such as there has never been, nor ever shall be after this. While this man, see when he sets himself, says the idol up, the Jews in, in Israel will rebel. Half of them will flee. Half of them will fight. Yeah. Persecution will set up. In the book of the Revelation, the seven seals will have been opened and the seven trumpets will be given. The seven trumpets cover the last three and a half years. And ecologically, 
what will happen under the seven trumpets of this? When the first trumpet, the angelic trumpet, sounds, one quarter of the trees in the world will be destroyed. And then when the second trumpet sounds, one quarter, sorry, one third of the oceans of the world will be turned to blood. Imagine all the fish that will die. All the sailors that will die. And then when the third trumpet is sounded, one third of all the freshwater lakes and streams and rivers will turn bitter so that nobody can drink from them. And then when the fourth one sounds, the sun will withdraw its shining by one third. And the world will be in semi darkness. That will be going on during this last three and a half years. This man of sin, of course, he will, at this time, he will be in charge of commerce. You won't be able to buy fresh water unless you go to him. You won't be able to buy unless you've got his mark. And during that three and a half years, he will persecute all those who turn to the Lord Jesus Christ in the preaching of this 144,000. And millions, I believe millions will be saved, but millions will suffer martyrdom because of what they believe. And then as we get to the end of this three and a half years, back in the Revelation chapter 16 now, at the end of this three and a half years, after the seven trumpets, the fourth one has sounded, the fifth one sounds, and, and hell, if you like, is opened up. And all the demonic powers that are being locked in there will be released. So there will be not only any no fresh water, food will be very, very scarce. The rivers will be turned to blood. The trees will be fall down. Breathing will be desperate. The demonic powers will be set free in the world. And the Lord is giving a man an opportunity to repent, to turn to him. And yet men will still not turn to the Lord. And so after the seventh trumpet has sounded, we have this period called the seven bowls, where the wrath of God, the judgment of God has gone forth. But now the wrath of God, the wrath of God is God's righteous, righteous anger. And the wrath of God is now being poured out. The sun which has pulled back its lights will shine seven times brighter and men will be scorched where they stand. There'll be darkness over this man of sin's area. And men will be, the Lord will plead with men to repent, but they will still reject him. And then we'll have this man of sin. He recognizes the signs and he will send out emissaries to the different nations of the world. And he will suggest that the problems of the world are down to what God is doing. And it's probably right. And he will gather together the leaders of the world and they will plan, as we read about it in Psalm 2. The leaders of the world will get together and they will say, let's cast off, let's join together and let's cast off the chains. Let's get rid of God. Let's get rid of his anointed. And they will plan and they will gather together at a place the Bible calls Megiddo or Armageddon. This man of sin knows that when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, he will come back to the Mount of Olives, he will come back to Megiddo first, and he will gather the armies to Armageddon. The armies are so big it will cover a 200 mile area, and as they are gathered together, then the heavens will open 
Revelation 19, the Lord Jesus Christ will come out of heaven, followed by his armies. I believe his armies, plural, are the angels and the church. They will come out after him. He will come to the Armageddon, to the battlefield. He will arrest the man of sin and his right hand man and cast them into the lake of fire. He will speak the word and Zechariah tells us that the whole of the armies and the people that are following the armies will be plagued. And reading through it, read it when you get home, Zechariah 14, it's like when the bombs dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The flesh will fall off them where they stand and the Lord will deal with them. And then as he's dealt with the enemies in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. He land on the Mount of Olives. And as if the Mount of Olives will split in two, half will go north, half will go south. But it would appear that the whole range, right the way through the Mediterranean, through the mountain range, will split in two, causing a valley. And the Mediterranean Sea will flood and fill the valley so the water comes right the way through to the Mount of Olives, through Jerusalem, through the Jordan Valley, down to the Dead Sea. And Jerusalem will become, for the first time, I think, a seaport. Because in the millennium, people will flow, love that way, people will flow into it. The Lord will rescue the Jews that are being persecuted. He'll send his Jewish what do you call it? He sent his angels and they shall gather his elect, these are his Jewish elect, from the four corners of the earth. They will all be brought to Jerusalem. Paul says that all Israel shall be saved. Then the Lord will separate the nations from the nations like a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Those who looked after the Jews, very important, those who looked after the Jews will be allowed in to the millennium. Those who didn't, those bad nations that didn't, will go, will be separated into what's called outer darkness. Then the Lord himself will be crowned as king and the temple will be built on Mount Zion. And this is the temple, we finally got there, this is the temple that Micah is speaking about in chapter 4. But in the last day it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. The blueprint for the temple is given in the last six chapters, last seven chapters of Ezekiel. But the Lord will then reign. They shall beat their swords into plowshares. They shall beat all their weapons. There will be no weapon. War shall not be war anymore. There will be nobody sleeping in the street. The Jews of that day will be his evangelists. They will go out and they will teach and they will be the teaching in the schools. The Bible, of course, will be the main textbook. And the Lord Jesus Christ shall rule and shall reign in that day. He will be King. He will be King Jesus. He will be the Lord Jesus. He will be our Jesus. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he will reign forever and ever. And ever. Need I tell you, brothers and sisters, that the very, I'm being gentle with you, the very best has yet to come. 
Father Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Micah. We thank you for all that your word tells us concerning the future. We thank you for our security, that we are safe and we are sure in him. And we thank you for this. We praise you, Father, for Micah and for the prophets and for all that you reveal to them and through them to us. Accept our thanks, we pray. For we ask it in the Saviour's lovely name. Amen. Amen. We've been asked to sing a hymn. It's